Alright guys, we're going to do a fur market update for 2019-2020 fur selling and trapping season. So at trappingtoday.com I do fur market update every year. I keep track of where prices are at, what the latest auction results have been. And every year before at the beginning of trapping season I try to give an idea of where we're at in the market. Just based on where the trends have been going, what demand looks like and all that. So this year you know, every year there's kind of a little bit of a theme in what's going on. This year the theme overall is, the way I put it, nothing has changed, but everything has changed. And I'll try to explain that. Nothing has changed in terms of fur prices. We're still at a very low bottom in the fur market in terms of prices. There's not a lot of demand for fur. Prices continue to be low for most items. There are some exceptions. We'll talk about that moving forward. But in terms of the overall market structure and how fur is going to be marketed this year, everything has changed. There's been a major shakeup in the fur market. So let's get right into it. Um, just to pick up where we left off in previous updates in the past year or two, there's still not a lot of demand for wild fur. Now you might be thinking, well the economy is great, why uh, aren't people buying fur as much, why, why is the demand low? Well the United States economy is awesome, I mean we're at the stock markets at an all time high, unemployment's at an all time low, the US dollar is incredibly strong, that's all great for people in the United States. But we sell most of our fur outside of the US and when you're exporting, um, a strong dollar is not a great thing and weak economies in the countries that you're exporting to is not a good thing. So we've got a lack of trade, a trade deal with China that that uh, we're dealing with. Uh, we have very weak economies in China and Russia and we have a strong dollar meaning that the buying power of these countries in terms of US dollars is much lower than it's been in the past. So all these things are working against wild fur and ranch fur. So the demand side continues to be poor in the fur market. Uh, but again, you have two parts of, the, uh, of every market is uh, demand and supply. Uh, the supply side is changing. So the, the, the supply of fur that's sold throughout the world, the vast majority of that is ranch fur. So most of you probably already know this. Ranch fur makes up, there's a lot of estimates, but somewhere most people think around 80% of the overall fur market. So that would leave wild fur comprising about 20%. So as you would expect, what happens in ranch fur is usually gonna be what drives the market. Ranch uh, fur, or fur farmers have specific costs of production that uh, they need to meet in order to pay their bills. So they gotta take care of animals, they gotta feed them, there's a certain cost associated with every aspect of producing ranch fur. Wild fur, we have costs as well, but a lot of trappers uh, trap more on the recreational side and they're okay with getting a lower price for fur uh, to a certain extent. There are a lot of trappers who need to get a certain price or they don't trap because they lose money. But overall, the, the ranch fur market has been uh, in, in a really difficult period over the last few years they've been losing money and these ranches can only go on for so many years of losing money before they have to go out of business and a lot of the ranch uh, ranchers have pelted out they've, they've sold all of their um, all their stock and they're out of the business they've run out of money uh, game over so the supply of ranch fur primarily uh, ranch mink and ranch fox has gone down considerably over the past few years uh, there's still a backlog of that fur that still has to be sold and the prices continue to be low because of low demand uh, but we're catching up we're we're working through that backlog and there aren't a lot of ranchers that are looking to up their production because there's no price incentive to do so so a lot of people are really down in the dumps in terms of the fur market and there's a lot of reasons to be so uh, personally, uh, and you'll notice I wrote this on trappingtoday.com, I just put a uh, fur market forecast together, and in the writing there I talked about how I'm a little bit optimistic. I don't think things are as bad as a lot of people uh, seem to think right now. The prices are low, the market's in a tough position, 
but there's only one direction to go in my opinion and that's up so I think we may start crawling out of here I, the last few years I've been predicting that 2020 was gonna be a bottom where we we're gonna start to see prices come up again and uh, I'm hoping and thinking that's gonna happen um, it's gonna be slow and it's gonna take a while but I think it's gonna happen now the big news how uh, everything has changed in the fur market uh, how fur is being sold is going to change a lot this year north american fur auctions the largest auction house uh, for a while that's selling both ranch fur and wild fur in the world uh, out of business nafa is filing for bankruptcy protection and they're pretty much out out of the game nafa will not be taking any wild fur for 2020 so this is a big deal a lot of trappers including myself have shipped fur to nafa i don't send a lot there but um, a lot of trappers send a lot of fur to nafa now the question is there's a lot of fur that's there that hasn't sold and a lot of trappers are wondering if they're ever going to get paid for that because um, nobody's really quite certain how this bankruptcy uh, proceeding is going to work and who's going to get paid first so that is a, that's a big problem for a lot of people. That started when a lot of uh, checks were being uh, checks from the last auction were bouncing, and trappers got in touch uh, with NAFA, tried to figure out what was going on. Then there was an announcement that we're going to reissue the checks, we're going to get financing, everything's going to be good, and then a follow-up announcement after a few weeks. Oh yeah, we couldn't get financing. Um, we're pretty much done. So what's happened is Saga or Saga Furs, which is a Finland-owned company, a Finnish company that primarily works in uh, ranch mink and ranch fox, has bought the ranch or is going to buy the ranch portion of Napa's business. They have no interest in the wild fur, so wild fur is kind of left out to dry, if you will. So all the furs that went to Napa, where are they going to go? There's a lot of trappers that are still going to produce fur and need to sell it somewhere. The country fur buyers, most of them are not around anymore. There's a few left, but a lot of the fur buyers in the country would buy your fur and they would ship it to Napa. And so that outlet is not there anymore. So it's going to make that more challenging. Fur Harvesters Auction is still in business and they're going strong. They're doing very well. See, one of the problems with Napa, as far as I can tell, is they overextended um, themselves uh, in this down market and they apparently provided a lot of backing for struggling mink ranchers and got themselves uh, along with these ranchers in a lot of debt that uh, they couldn't work their way out of because prices have not recovered. So uh, fur harvesters uh, specializes in wild fur. They sell the bulk of what they sell is wild fur and they appear to be uh, adhering by some very strong business practices and they're doing a good job managing their finances even in the low market so FHA is ready to go and they're gearing up they're going to add capacity and expect to take a lot more fur uh, and a lot of the fur that NAFA uh, used to take should be going to fur harvesters so stay tuned for more on that they did if you go to furharvesters.com they did issue an update for trappers and they're going to add receiving areas and and receiving dates and routes uh, throughout the country so they're they're looking to gear up Gronwald fur and wool company is uh, out of the midwest and they run routes all over the country they're gearing up to increase the number of routes they run they usually don't go to the northeast they're looking to go to the northeast this year they're also looking to run routes into canada so that's something to stay tuned on Grunwald is probably going to be buying a lot more fur this year. And there's other guys like uh, um, Xander Fur, Petska Fur Company. There's a lot of medium to small size companies that will probably be buying more fur uh, to make up for uh, the NAFA downfall. So that's where the market has changed a lot. Um, but overall, we are going to be, continue to be in a low market. Uh, one other thing that I did want to talk about, and then we're going to go into specific prices for individual species. Uh, but the the idea of fur as as a fashion item versus fur as a utility and there is a big difference so fur as a fashion item is is typically something that's driven by uh, you know fashion trends which have to do with uh, 
how people feel and how something looks and then culturally how it's accepted. So if something becomes popular, some popular people start wearing this certain fashion item, it becomes fashionable, more people want to wear it, more people see their friends wearing this thing, they want to wear it, it, it just demand grows and grows and grows, it becomes a trend, a fad, something that's around is extremely popular and then oftentimes that fashion trend goes away and it's followed by a different trend. High fashion is something that can attract extremely high prices for uh, fur. And an example of like a high fashion item that's it's kind of a trend but it's been going on for a long time is the fur items that are made from the bellies of bobcats, primarily western bobcats that have those really white bellies with distinct black spots uh, throughout them. And that is uh, a very popular in Russia and it's very high end, very expensive items uh, that are sold um, with that fur. That's what drives the bobcat market and that's why we were seeing bobcats a few years ago averaging upwards of $700 to $1,000 a piece for those western cats. So that's kind of high fashion, uh, more moderate, medium type of fashion would be Canada Goose uh, parkas, uh, down parkas that are lined or trimmed with coyote uh, fur. And so the hood of the parka would have coyote fur trim on it. Uh, those coats are like $800 a piece. So they're not like thousands and thousands of dollars. They're affordable, but they're also pretty high end in terms of average Joe isn't gonna be buying one of those coats. So they're kind of the middle of the road. But that's a fashion trend, and that has driven the coyote market, which we'll, we'll go into in a minute. Then you have fur as a utility. And fur as a utility is where fur is, is less of a fashion statement, and it's more of, I wear this to keep warm. And that can be part of the culture. You know, in Russia, uh, people wear fur all the time. It's just kind of part of their culture. It's a big deal. And it's usually low, more medium to lower end items that the average middle class person can afford. And so uh, those utility items are, are driven, while the fashion is, is usually driven by the higher end of society that can afford things, even in a tough market and a tough economy, those people have enough money that they, they can afford it all, at all times. The, the utility side of things, you know, fur is just a little bit expensive and the economy is really poor and people aren't making a lot of money that can really hurt consumption of fur as a utility item. So those are some things to think about. Um, it seems as though fur has gotten away from fashion over the past few decades and gone more to utility in emerging markets and developing countries uh, like China, Russia, Korea, and other similar places uh, where it used to be fashion more in the United States, uh, Italy, um, and, and places like that. So it's something that's a long-term trend to think about. But fashion versus utility, always, always want to consider what things are being used for and how different economic drivers can affect that. So let's go into some individual prices for specific items. First, I want to mention coyote. And it's always nice to start on a good note because coyote prices have been really good for the past few years. And that's probably going to continue. There's no reason that this trend with Canada Goose parkas is going to slow down anytime this season. Uh, Canada Goose has a lot of demand, they're still growing. The stock price um, struggled a little bit a few months ago, but it seems to be bouncing back and, and they're, selling, they're selling stuff. Um, they're in pretty good shape going into the holiday season as far as, as we can tell. So the Western Coyotes, um, the really soft fur, the, the high quality prime pelts, are probably going to average right between seventy and hundred dollars, and this is going to depend on you know the auctions and what the demand is at, at particular time. But I think you can you can depend on seventy to hundred dollars. Maybe a country buyer you might be looking at sixty to seventy, a little more on the lower end of that. Um, but but those are going to be strong. Now on the, on the mid the mid coyotes would be more of like say western coyotes that are caught early in the season or your prime coyotes that are from places like the Northeast US or Ontario, where the, 
the pelt is a little bit different, the hair is coarse and longer and it's not as soft. Those coyotes kind of fill the market where um, the people who are trying to make these imitation coats to be similar to Canada Goose but cheaper, the more utility market or the copycat fashion, those are becoming quite popular in China. Um, those, when the demand for the higher end coyotes has kind of been eaten up most of that available market, uh, a lot of those uh, will, a lot of those buyers will go in and buy the medium to lower quality coyotes, and that drives the price up for everybody. So those northeast coyotes, I'm I'm guessing right now we're going to be looking at somewhere in the forty dollar range, and they could advance up to fifty depending on demand. And then your southern coyotes and all what's left in the sort of the uh, Midwest, uh, we're probably looking at around fifteen to thirty dollars, and that's going to depend on on where we're at, where we're at, what particular auction uh, you're in. But uh, it, it's probably going to be be closer to thirty than it is to fifteen, uh, if I was to guess. Uh, let's move on to beaver. So we we go from really good news to really bad news. Although beaver, I think we've all kind of come to accept the fact that beaver is not going to sell for much money they haven't uh, they haven't been a fashion item uh, beaver fur and coats and other sort of utility or fashion or hats or, it's just not happening right now uh, no one has uh, deemed it worth going into the high cost of dressing beaver and producing uh, fur products out of beaver when they can just use cheap ranch meat so the, the beaver, really the, the hatter market or the market where basically they take beaver pelts, they buy them by the pound and they grind them up and they make this felt that they use to make uh, cowboy hats, like uh, the Stetson cowboy hats. That's made out of, out of beaver felt. So that's what we call the hatter market. That, there's always demand, but they don't pay much for those pelts. and. For a hatter beaver, you get almost as much for a southern, uh, lower quality, not unprime pelt as you will for a northern, fully prime beaver pelt, which is kind of sad for those high-end beaver pelts, uh, but that's kind of where we're at. So if, if the hatter market continues to be the only market, the only game in town, we're going to continue to see averages of $10 to $14 on beaver. However, there can be some advances here. If we start to see the ranch mink uh, supply going down, we start to see a little bit more demand pick up. Uh, I think we can see $15 to $20 beavers for those eastern uh, higher quality prime pelts. Uh, last year for harvesters, auction averaged $18 for those beaver in their last auction. So there was some demand there and I think that could happen again. I think more likely than not uh, toward the end of the first selling season, maybe next March uh, or, or beyond, I think we're gonna see beavers creep up a little bit but that remains to be seen uh, caster as long as beaver the beaver harvest remains low the caster price is going to remain high we're probably going to be looking at 50 to 70 dollars a pound depending on grade muskrat expect average of somewhere around three dollars to start the season uh, we could see th 350 to four um, i don't think muskrat are going to get much lower than three dollars and I don't think they're going to get much higher than four or five. Um, there could be some advancement. Uh, muskrat are often substituted for ranch mink, uh, but there's still a lot of ranch mink on the market. As we move through the ranch mink, uh, muskrat may, may start to advance a little bit, but three to four is probably a safe number. Now, wild mink um, haven't done good at all for a very long time, and I expect that will probably continue. Uh, we should see around five five dollars for females around eight ten dollars for males uh, could come up just a little bit otter expect twenty to thirty dollars that's been our average for a very long time otter really depend on uh, specific uses and specific fashion trends that would drive that market and about uh, seven or eight years ago eight or ten years ago there was a big boom in the otter market that was driven by fashion and we haven't seen that since. It dropped off and it's continued to drop off, but it seems to have hit a floor around 20, 20 to 25 dollars, maybe 30. Raccoon, so raccoon is a, a case where, you know, otter, basically all otter are worth the same all over the country for the most part. Um, size, they'll differ a little bit, but 
Raccoon is the exact opposite. Raccoon has a wide variety of sizes, quality, and price. And the bigger, thicker, heavier raccoon, which you typically find like in the upper Midwest, like uh, maybe Minnesota and Iowa, places like that, those are your higher quality coon, and those are starting to see some demand. Um, they're actually they're being used for some trim on those those uh, parkas. They uh, there's some a little bit of a coat market there I believe is developing not much but uh, so those higher quality coon are seeing some demand and that's increasing a little bit. I'm thinking a safe average for those uh, bigger better coon is probably ten to fifteen dollars. Um, now as you go down in size as you go down in quality of pelt. Uh, it drops off substantially. Uh, the rest, the lower end coons, uh, maybe are going to average five dollars or less. Some of them probably won't even have uh, any demand at all, so you may not be able to sell them at all. So coon is a case where you know you may want to be pretty selective in how you harvest them um, if you have that option. Uh, red fox, ten to fifteen dollars, really disappointing market. There are some that'll go over twenty. Uh, some of the real cherry reds. Uh, in their, their specific fox like uh, Northeast and Maine we have a few fox that'll do well there are places like uh, the western states where you have if you get a really nice fox you can get $25-30 dollars for it but 10 to 15 is probably going to be about it for now uh, until things start to change a little bit Bobcat now Bobcat is similar to Coon you have really high end Bobcat and then you have the rest and so there's going to be a big price difference and the buyers seem to be getting pickier and pickier and pickier the last few auctions where they only want the best quality cats with the best bellies the clear bellies with with the distinct spots and they're they're being more choosy because there seem to be a few less buyers a few a little bit less demand and uh, there's quite a bit of supply on the market relative to demand so those cats i'm a safe number is in the three to four hundred dollar range for those western bobcats that are some of the best ones out there. The rest of the cats you're probably looking at thirty to sixty dollars for most other parts of the country, southern, northeast. Uh, the Canadian cats, some of them might might be higher than that, and then some of the the second grade uh, western cats you maybe maybe a hundred two hundred dollars here and there, but there's not a lot of those. You're going to have a lot of high end and a lot of low end. Uh, Lynx, Martin, and Fisher, uh, they're, they're going to continue to struggle, although, I, again, just like a lot of these other items, I don't see prices going any lower than they've been the past year or two, and, and I think the only place to go from here is up. Um, that being said, Lynx, Lynx should be $150, $200 in a, in a normal market. They've been $60 to $70, so they've been less than half of what, they've been, what they were five, six years ago. And I would expect Lynx to continue to sell at sixty to seventy dollar averages uh, throughout this year. Um, later in the year, that could advance uh, depending on what the market does and how that unfolds. Like I've said on all these other items, uh, Martin. There's been good demand for Martin until the last auction of the season this past year, and things really tanked. They dropped off a cliff. The demand just wasn't there. I'm not really sure why. Uh, there just there just didn't seem to be uh, enough buyers interested in the Martin that were for sale, and unfortunately prices went way way down. The Alaskan Martin they were getting uh, close to a hundred dollars a couple of years ago. Uh, they were dropped down to sixty to seventy dollars, and that last auction was even lower than that. Uh, that would put our Northeast Martin at twenty to forty dollars between you know the Northeast and Maine parts of Ontario. And, uh, and New Brunswick, as well as your Martin in the western states like Wyoming and Montana um, and Idaho. $20 to $40, that's probably where we're going to start out this season. And then uh, the Alaskan Martin, we may be looking at $50 to $60, but this market has potential to climb pretty quickly to back to that $70 to $100 um, if we get the right situation and, and the market starts to unfold. We'll just have to kind of see how that all plays out. Fisher bounces around a lot. It has bounced around a lot the past few years. Um, so there, there's a wide range in Fisher prices. I think they could go as low as $20, $25. Uh, 
Um, they probably won't go much higher than 40 to 45. So I know that's a wide range. Uh, I would expect closer to the $40 price target, um, but we're gonna have to see how things, how things go with Fisher prices. So that's what I have overall. I know there's a few other fur items, but uh, really, you know, skunk, uh, there won't be much, five bucks maybe for skunk, possum, you might not be able to sell them, maybe a dollar or two. Uh, the gray fox, maybe 10 or $15. Weasels, you know, it's just gonna depend. Um, it ain't gonna be much. But uh, the good news is, I think these prices that I'm quoting are gonna be on the low end. They're, these are realistic prices and I think there's gonna be room for advancement as we go throughout the season. So I'll be sure to keep you updated. Uh, one thing to expect, don't expect much information on fur prices coming out of the gate here. There's state auctions, uh, those are gonna be going on and I'll provide updates as the state auctions unfold. Usually like Maine and Vermont have early auctions. A lot of states don't have auctions till January, February and March. But we'll keep you updated on that on trappingtoday.com. And then you have like grown walls, people, you know, I'll know a few trappers here and there that'll give reports on what they, what they got for their, their furs. But most of these early season, other than guys like Grunwald who have a ready market and they know what they can pay, a lot of these country buyers and the smaller buyers are gonna be speculating. And they've been burned the past few years so they're not gonna be willing to pay much on speculation. So I would say that you're not gonna know the true price until the first major auctions. And those fur harvesters is not gonna have an auction until March. So we're not gonna know a lot this entire season. So it's gonna be, it's gonna be kind of, we're gonna have to be patient to kind of watch things play out and see how, how things go. Um, but I'll do my best to keep you updated. Get out there, set some traps, have fun most importantly. It's not all about the money. It's about being outside, it's about for a lot of us, managing fur bear populations at healthy levels, getting out and enjoying trapping, learning about the animals, getting in the woods, um, and, and yeah, maybe we'll pay the gas. At these prices, we'll still be able to pay the gas. Um, we ain't gonna get rich, but we're not in it for the money anyway, right? All right, guys, thanks very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated with future videos. Take care.